First of all, I just want to say welcome to Lynx Academy 2017 and a special session on the healthcare heroes and the amazing impact that guys like these have on the industry and the patients in which we work. I also want to say a massive thank you to all the heroes that have joined me today uh, for the time today, but more for the time in the, in the development of the campaign, but really a thank you for what you do for patients and for the broader, broader healthcare community. We produced the Healthcare Heroes, and the reason we did it was to really shine a light on the people in the front line of healthcare, the people who are supporting patients day in and day out, and provide the industry with a real insight into how we can better support and collaborate with them. So with that, I'm going to go around each of the heroes who are just going to briefly introduce themselves uh, for a couple of minutes and tell you a little bit about the background and the stories and why they're here today. So Matt, I'm going to start with you. Hello everybody, good afternoon. I might be familiar to some of you here, and most of you, I hope. Um, well, I am actually had Parkinson's disease now for 41 years, and I guess one of the reasons that I'm here is because it's become part of my daily life. I don't let it get me down. I've done plenty of interesting things, and really, I want to prove that having a chronic illness, you can be positive, and you can live a full life as well. I've skydived, I was an official photographer at the London 2012 Olympic Games. Um, I have a great life now. I'm helping out at Havas, as, as you know. Um, but basically, having Parkinson's and having a chronic illness isn't the end of your life. And if I can encourage and spread that message, then I've done something good and I'm, I'll be pleased with that. Cheers, Matt. I'm there. Uh... Uh, my name is Tal Goldsworthy. I'm a chartered engineer um, from the process industries, but I also have Marfan syndrome, which, apart from meaning long, thin bones and dodgy visual, visual acuity, also means cardiovascular implications. Uh, I went along to a genetic study in 1992 and was talked through the total root replacement operation to replace my ascending aorta, and I was not impressed. So I built a technical team of medics and engineers I started a company, raised the money, ran the project, and I had the first personalised external aortic root support put around my marfanoid aorta in May 2004. I'm now the technical director of the company. We manufacture. We're working with about 10 centres. We've got about another five coming on. But we've had to struggle very hard against unbelievable obstructive conservatism amongst cardiothoracic surgeons. So don't ask me what I think of them. The ones working with us are amazing. Some of the others, well. So we've now done, we've now done 104 patients uh, successfully. Uh, we've had one operative death, pretty much inevitable in cardiothoracic surgery. We've had a couple of conversions on the table to different surgeries. Three of our lady patients have had com four completely normal pregnancies and deliveries. So there are four people who owe their lives to this project, very literally. Um, and I'm just hoping I get it really rolled out so more patients can get access to this treatment uh, before it's too late for me. Thank you very much. And Naomi. Hi, I'm Naomi Campbell, and um, I'm a nurse, um, not a supermodel, as you can see. <laughs> um, and um, I'm the first nurse in the UK to specialise in basic hydration care, fundamentally. So my background in nursing has been very varied in the past, but due to uh, looking after my um, mum through a long terminal illness, it was a real reminder to me just how hard it is to help people to drink, um, both physically and to encourage them to drink. And that really became the kind of like the, the catalyst, I suppose. Um, then I had an idea for a drinking aid, watching one of my children uh, use a, a, a toy to drink from. And then I just kind of like kept going then because I realized that once I started looking at hydration, it was like prizing a lid um, off a, a can of worms, really, because what it did was demonstrate there are so many issues around such fundamental care. So, yeah, so I'm very, very, very happy to be here today and have a voice for basic care. So thank you. <laughs> and then uh, John. Hello, my name is John Jackson. I work for the uh, Royal Blackburn Teaching Hospital. I'm the bereavement care champion, and I move people down to the mortuary. Uh, how it's improved, since like we said, we've had the healthcare heroes, and how we have improved, we move people down now, we take them down on the bed. 
uh, we move people down uh, with a care and compassion. And it's a lot nicer to move them on a bed than moving them on a trolley or anything like that. Because when you move them on the bed, we have a, we have like a roller board, which is you don't know what one of them are. A pat slide, just like a pat, it's like a pat slide, but it's a roller board. You can just slide them across and it makes them so gentle and it makes them so nice as you're moving across. I always say, I always make sure that uh, I always put a flower on if it's an adult. Uh, and I always say good night, God bless to them. Uh, if it's a child, I always take, if I take the children down, I never cover the faces, or if it's a baby. Uh, we never do anything like that. We take them down on the bed, but I never roll aboard them. I always uh, lift them. I always lift them and move them across. But I always try and make it look like a bed. And if I make it look like a bed, I always make sure the special things they have a little teddy outside of them. That's very important to them. Because, like, say, uh, when my mum, my mum passed away uh, about three or four years ago, and my sister said she can't go to heaven without a teddy. So ever since, but like I say, I always do it for a child. And it's, it's a, how can I put it? It's like when you go in and you talk to the families, because when they've lost someone, everybody's so vulnerable. They're vulnerable when they're in hospital anyway, but when you lose someone or something like that, then you explain to family how we do it, how we take the patient down. We always, I always speak to the patient as I'm going down as well. But sometimes the families come down as well. So some like to say little prayers or whatever they need to, they want to. And it's them last couple of, them last few seconds is that the thing, it's what they always remember when someone passes away. Because I've had experience myself. Everybody has, everybody in the room has. But it's them last few seconds that they remember. So that's me personally what I do. I was very fortunate. I won the Kate Granger for Care and Compassion. It's Care and Compassion. It's the first time that it was done for an individual last year. And it was made uh, such an honour to me because Kate uh, choose it from a national award, choose the, the, sh the short three, the, the three that were uh, shortlisted, and she picked me as a winner, but the one that made it so special, she died three weeks before, and she did it just before she passed away, so I will always treasure that. But like I say, I do love my job, but that's me, John Jackson. Mm. And thank, thank you. you. And Michael? Follow him. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one. Follow you. You don't want to sit next to John. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, I've been a patient for 30 plus years. Um, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, which probably many of you are familiar with, an incurable bowel condition at 12. Um, spent uh, uh, 25, 30 operations, intestinal failure, and became the 11th patient in the UK to have an intestinal transplant at the Church Hospital in Oxford. Um, and I had an ostomy, a stoma, as part of that. For those of you who don't know, you can basically go to the toilet in a bag like that that's connected to your body. Um, and it's not great. Uh, and they leak and they spill. And then your doctors go, can you measure it? And here's a jug that you're going to measure it into. And it's not the greatest thing in, since sliced bread. Um, I was lucky with transplant. I had nine months in hospital. So I bought some kit off eBay, uh, YouTube videos, and hacked together a sensor. That sensor became Eleven Health, the company. Um, and now um, we are uh, a team of uh, 16 or 17. Um, Unfortunately, and I know we'll go on and talk about it, unfortunately the bulk of my business is in the US. We're fully regulated, we're FDA cleared, we're insurance, and we're in 20 of the major centres in the US and, and, and growing from there. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just a great believer that um, healthcare has had an awful long time to try and fix itself, and it's people f with other perspectives that are going to find the solutions in healthcare now, not the industry itself. Uh, Steve Watts, born and bred only a mile away from here. Um, very proud of that. And um, well, at 17, I joined the Grenadier Guards, came out of the Guards, joined the power industry. And while I was reading an article about a certain guy who lives in the Lake District called Josh Naylor, he inspired me to go and meet him up in the lakes. He's a Lakeland farmer and he's a legend when it comes down to fell running. He told me to stop smoking, lose some weight, and well, I start running. So I did. Uh, after a few years, did quite a few unique events. More importantly was one running from here to Blackpool non-stop with my dog um, and that dog raised £3,000 from then on it inspired us to raise more money. Um, while my own son needed Bouval I was asked if I'd support the only then um, 
a lady clinician within Europe in um, brain surgery. Matthew's going to be fine, Steve, but would you help us raise a million pounds? Uh, seconded to the appeal for two years by my previous employees, stayed on at Booth Hall after having raised the money within 18 months and raised a further £2,500 for an orthodontic centre of excellence, um, a brand new A&E department and a, and a, um, a Burns aftercare centre as well. Came out of fundraising and now we inspire people to love the lakes, take children up there, families and, and support anybody that wants to love and, and take an active role in their life been given a second chance with a pacemaker which I never ever had thought I would need and with that set a world record in that I'm the first person to run the Everest Marathon with a pacemaker and raised a lot of money for some Sherpa children whose fathers I witnessed got killed the previous time I was there. That's Steve. Thank you. Thank you. So for me that's um, already like a pretty amazing introduction. Uh, the Healthcare Heroes has resonated really well with the healthcare community and as I heard the different introductions you can see why. You know, from Steve's determination, with Michael we've got this creativity, compassion, innovation, uh, risk, exquisite risk we described before, and Matt with his enthusiasm and his energy. And these are some of the great qualities that have really come to the fore in this book, which we're very grateful for. Now we're going to move to some questions. So we're going to start with, with Lindsay. You've got your microphone. Over to you. Hi, um, my question is, um, how did you feel when you were first approached and found out that we wanted you to be one of our healthcare heroes? Steve, I thought you'd say that. I couldn't believe it. Uh, why? Why me? Um, when, when, well, I just couldn't believe it. I was absolutely gobsmacked at first and then um, you, you, you don't really realise what you've achieved or you know, the, 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 what has come from that. And, and how many people it is going to affect until it's brought really to your attention from somebody outside of the circle of friends that know what you're doing it for. And that's what's happened. It's just completely, completely gone off the scale um, for all the right we reasons may add. And, and so, yeah, if, if that's any help to your answer. John, Amazing. when we met in London, you were talking about what it meant to you. Mm. What it meant to me was, it's surprising, we, uh, we got information, somebody wanted to come and see me. Uh, one, it was one, I think it was Thursday night. So they come late because they, they found out of the night, but I was, I couldn't believe that somebody wanted to come and see me. They came to see me, we had a good talk about my job, what I did, everything I did. And then in January, they said the book will launch in January. Well, I just thought it was going to be like a little pamphlet, little thing. <laughs> when it came, Lorna, uh, who's from communication, she rung me up, she better come in. When I come in and I saw the book, I was absolutely amazed and thrilled that they did ask me to be an healthcare hero. I am so proud to be an healthcare hero. It's unbelievable. And uh, the thing is, my children, my own family are so proud that I am. And like I say, they've all got a, bit, they've all got a book and it's been signed with people. And the thing is that it goes down into my grandchildren and they look at that and they think, this is what granddad did. And that's what it means to me. Mm. Amazing. And um, Tal, in the book, one of the things um, that you're quoted as saying is you didn't set out to fix the world, you just set out to fix yourself. So, from a healthcare hero point of view, like, what was your thoughts when you were invited? Well, there has to be one gatecrasher and one fraud, and I'm the man. <laughs> I, there's no way I was a hero. The, the reason I did what I did was because I was a coward and I was terrified at the thought of total root replacement. Uh, once I'd fixed myself, uh, it wasn't until then that I thought, OK, right, we can do other people. So now I, I, I suppose I might lay some sort of claim in part to being a healthcare hero. But at the, at the outset, it was just a grim, a grim struggle against all sorts of problems, which somehow I managed to overcome. Now it's different. Now we're, we're rolling it out, we're, making, we're fixing other people. Uh, I, I was surprised to be approached by the, the Healthcare Heroes um, initiative. I was delighted to see that there are organizations and companies that aren't just greedy grasping bastards but can actually put something back into society i've been amazed at the philanthropy i went to the london launch and it was stunning what an amazing event what an incredible buzz fantastic people fantastic organization i'm just sorry it wasn't better uh, spread throughout the media shame on the main um, tv companies because it's an incredible initiative and it's made a real difference 
The book is beautiful. I still cannot believe that they were giving them away free at the launch <laughs> event. This is a 50 or 75 quid book. The, the philanthropy is stunning. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I say, I'm a, I'm a fraud. I'm a bloody, I'm a, an outlier. I shouldn't really be here, but I'm <laughs> delighted to be here. <laughs> delighted to be here and delighted to be supporting Links Have Us in something that is so worthwhile. It's unbelievably refreshing in this dreadfully cynical world in which we live. In, I mean, in my humble opinion, you are the perfect healthcare hero. <laughs> well, there you go. But life's like that, isn't it? Many, if we got behind the real stories of many of our heroes in history, we'd actually find they were perhaps not quite, you know, all they were cracked up to be. And maybe that's one, maybe that's me, maybe that's me. Uh, Lindsay, you've got a second question as well, haven't you? Which I think Michael will probably want to answer. Okay, um, no. Michael. <laughs> um, who is your hero and why? It's my hero and why. Okay, if I put my family to one side for a minute, because obviously everything that I do is really about my kids. Um, my transplant surgeon, um, Anil Vadia. It was bizarre. Um, I rocked up to Oxford six and a half years ago um, with um, knowing that they'd done ten transplants and five hadn't survived. Five hadn't even left, got off the operating table. And I was going to be number one um, of the restarted programme. And I was like, you Google, and there's nothing out there. And I went in to see him, and I went into a, an NHS private room. The desk had three legs. There were two chairs, and there were eight of us, and it was just ridiculous. And he walked in, and he had just this most bizarre fitting Ralph Lauren jeans on that just didn't even get to his ankles. <laughs> and I'm like, whatever. And I had eight lever arch files on the side of all my notes, and he didn't open one of them. He took the notepad, and he drew what my bowel looked like now, what it would look like after surgery. And in those literally two or three minutes, we built that trust, respect, that empathy. And I wouldn't be here today without him. Without doubt, he's my hero. Amazing. And uh, uh, Matt? <laughs> um, Other than Slavin Village. <laughs> <laughs> um, originally, it was Jacques Cousteau, and that's who I wanted to be, actually, as a little boy until uh, I got the diagnosis of Parkinson's. Um, but actually, it's, my hero now is Steve Watts, who sat at the other end of the table. Oh. <laughs> sorry, to, sorry Steve. Don't start me off. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't know whether, I hope most of you know the story that Steve took myself and Joe up La Frig and um, I haven't been able to walk that far for a long time. And I didn't think I'd ever be able to do it. And he, Steve, helped me to get up there. And I was so grateful to him that, yeah, particularly after what he's been through. But not only that, he raised a million pounds for Booth Hall Children's Hospital. And I spent all my formative years in that hospital. And uh, I don't know, we just seemed to connect. And it, he's like, it's like, like a dad to me, even though he's not old enough to be my dad, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> big, big brother, big brother. <laughs> he really is. So, Steve Watts is my hero. Oh. Oh. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, uh, Steve took up Matt and Joe uh, to the top of the mountain, and I think it's a really nice byproduct for healthcare heroes that we've got these friendships coming together. Steve, do you want to talk about that trip that you took? <laughs> Can I follow that? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> this is what this is the strength of what you have created, and you should be, as already has been said, you should be very, very proud indeed. Friendships in this modern society are very, very hard to come by, but when you get one as unique as what has been formed here, well, is special. I read the story, and also about Joe, whose eyesight is also going and I knew that she only had so long left. And I read in the mail that, that the BBC had took her out because they had the story about Joe, and that they took her to see the real Lake District. They hadn't. They'd sat on a boat on Hull's Water and had a little bit of an afternoon row and made a story of it. So when I read that, I thought, right, that's not the Lakes. I'll show her the real Lakes. And I contacted Joe, and I said, I want to show you the real, my Lake District with all the hidden gems that I know. And I think with Matt, Obviously, he's, he's, he's wanting to get to a summit. I know the nicest summit. Unfortunately, when we went last week, it wasn't. It was a bit blustery. It was a bit windy. It was a bit wet and a bit miserable. But I can assure you, when it takes its hat off, 
that panorama from where we were is unbelievable. And so that's what I wanted to do, take them both up there. And I did boss them about a bit. I was a little bit sort of the old Grenadier Guards <laughs> sort of section commander-ish, but I think without that, we may not have achieved what we set out to do that day and what a day it was. And thanks, Matt. Blown away. Can you give Stephen Matt a big round of applause for that? It was amazing. <laughs> So, going to move the conversation now towards, towards innovation. So, Ben, have you got your question? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this question is specifically for Naomi. Hi. Um, and speaking of innovation in a world dominated by technology, I think your simple solutions are actually very refreshing. Uh, so, is that a model that you're aiming to stick to for any future products, so are you going to start adding Bluetooth <coughs> for? Um, <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, well, simplicity, I think, is probably... It's simple because it needs to be simple uh, as a starter, um, and because I have a lot of simple ideas. <laughs> um, and I'm very, very bad at maths. Um, never got a G, you know, O level as it used to be, and I think I scraped a grade four third time round. So I'm not quite sure how I got into... I wouldn't get into nursing now, for example. Um, so when I used to look at people having to calculate how much somebody had had to drink, something as simple as just, you know, how much tea somebody had. And I was thinking, why are we still having to work out or guess, you know, how much is in a, in a cup? And, and then when I looked at some of the jugs and the beakers that were available, um, it was just a traditional, like, a kitchen scale. And I thought, we don't need to know how much is in the cup. We need to know... We need to know how much somebody's had to drink. That's the important thing. So I just thought, well, we'll just turn the scale upside down, and then it's just like a plumb line going down. And, and, and the minute I, you know, I had it in my head for ages, but I just, I just sketched it out on a, um, cut up an ice cream container, made a, and got an indelible pen, and kept squirting another 25 mils into a cup, and then just went to somebody at the university in Falmouth and said, is there any way that you could put a scale and glaze it into the mug. Um, so that was that. Um, the red, amber, green idea is a well-known triage that's used throughout you know, a lot of healthcare areas. It's just really the application of what sits behind it, really. So, um, and then I've got other ideas that I um, have got in the pipeline. So the drinking straw that started, really, the ideas. Um, incredibly simple. I mean, like, I can't believe to this day that it actually got a UK patent granted, which is... I now realise is, is quite an achievement because it means that it's a, a brand new novel idea and, and that it has been, it's, it's been assessed to have some worth. Um, my frustration is that I had, um, I was lucky enough to get a small grant right at the beginning through the um, NHS innovation, but there was no follow up. And I think that, if anything, I'm probably going slightly off track here, but the, the message I would say for innovation in healthcare is, you know, why would you give somebody £15,000 and not come back and find out how they've got on? Or ask them, would you like some more support? Or, well done, you've got a patent. Uh, can we now give you some more money to like, move this forward? Um, my sense of frustration is... I won't go into quite your level of frustration, <laughs> but, you know... <laughs> let's just say uh, I, we share a very common ground, really. So... Um, so innovation-wise, um, I've been um, very fortunate um, to have been set up with, a, um, with funding to start a, um, a not-for-profit um, social enterprise called Simple Measures. Uh, and that's, that's really it. It's, it's simple things which can make a big difference. Um, so that's what we're looking at, really. Um, a lot of these things, then, need to be very cleverly put to be made simple, for example, taking a lot of information and putting it into something like an app, for example. So I couldn't do that, but I can give people the information, the content to maybe go into an app. And, you know, like I, only four years ago, I sat in a big room of about 60 people at a university kind of like promotional thing. And eventually I put my hand up and they always say there's no such thing as a stupid question. And I said, oh, you've been talking about this word throughout the last hour. And they said, oh, what was that? And I said, it's app. And the whole room just roared with laughter because I had no idea what an app was. And so that's why, you know, so there's a lot of, lot of new stuff to, to come forward. So, yeah. I mean, I, I personally can't agree more in terms of we're a creative agency. And I think it's about powerful insights and simple ideas. Mm. 
as you've demonstrated, have a really big impact. Um, Tal, on the theme of innovation, could you talk a little bit about where your idea came from and the inspiration for that? Simple necessity. Yeah. I, I had a condition. I didn't like what was on offer. I put in place a very simple engineering solution. It, it really is very, very simple. All I'm saying is we want a device that perfectly fits the outside of this pipe to stop it getting any bigger. The execution was significantly more complex than the basic idea, but the idea, you know, just came into my head. If you, I mean, I was in research and development with the National Coal Board. I spent my whole life in R&D, going around places, looking at things, listening, picking up information. I knew that there were various types of medical scanning and that most of them were computer tomographic. I knew there were a whole host of computer-aided design options. I was very familiar with what was called rapid prototyping and is now erroneously called 3D printing. So I was aware of selective uh, laser sintering, stereolithography, fused deposition modeling, blah, 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 blah. So I just said, right, well, we just take some images, fire them into CAD, produce a rigid model of an aorta, somewhat like that, and then we can use that to make a perfectly fitting device. So for me, the basic ideas were dead simple and were already in my head. The execution was slightly more complex, both technical and commercial. But so, it's, it's interesting what, what, um, what Naomi says about innovation. Because I've been dealing pretty much exclusively with cardiothoracic surgeons who are criminally conservative, um, one thing that really struck me, I did this presentation on this project to a load of HIV physicians who have been confronted with an entirely new disease, an entirely new infective agent, which operates through, I, th I believe, an entirely new process, disease process, that wasn't previously known. And these guys have had to innovate. You know, the only way we can cure our patients and stop them dying is to think of something new. And when I gave them this presentation, they said to me, that's great, why aren't all the cardiothoracic surgeons doing it? And I said, well, you need to go and ask them. Because they, but it shows you that innovation, that, that mindset is not entirely absent in the NHS. It's just absent in the part of the NHS I'm in. <laughs> Fair enough. Which I think is um, a really good point. Um, moving on, uh, Hannah McKenzie, we have a question. This is for Michael. Um, yeah, for Michael. Um, I was just wondering, what sort of treatments did you have prior to having the transplant? So I know you said you had quite a lot of surgery, but did you have like the typical biologics and follow that road, or was it quite severe to the point where you had to go straight to surgery? So, first thing I remember is um, I was diagnosed over. 30 years ago, so there weren't the biologics around then. It was steroids and um, heavy, heavy immunosuppressed drugs like azathioprine and Imuran. They were the sort of frontline treatment. So there wasn't the range of options in my formative years that there is now. Um, yeah, I, I've been unlucky. I'm a, that sort of I extreme end of Crohn's that, that is not that common. Uh, um, you know, a bowel transplant won't ever be like kidney transplant that is becoming more and more common. Um, so yeah, I, I went through all the medications, but I was roughly having an operation every 18 months to resect the bowel. So a bowel that starts at sort of six meters, for me ended up at 40 centimeters, even though the steroids, the azathioprine, the biologics, the infliximabs and the humeras that are more recent drugs, I got to them probably quite late in my own journey. I then had intestinal failure, and once you have intestinal failure, there's no drugs that are gonna get you back. You're basically connected to uh, intravenous feeding to keep you alive. Um, and then the slope from there is, it starts to damage your liver. And those, those are the criteria actually for, for transplant, for intestinal transplant. You kind of have to get to that severity before they'll even consider it. Um, so yeah, I went through the range, but my starting point was earlier than where we are today. And Michael, how did you find the emotions that you were going through pre-surgery? Oh shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a good description. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, look, I remember I was at UCH Hospital in London for 18 months. I was connected to TPN for 18 months and told you need a bowel transplant and told do not have it in the UK. It is too severe. And I went out to Mount Sinai in New York, who said, we'll do it for you, and we want half a million dollars. I didn't know you at the time. I could have got the money <laughs> off you. Or uh, Steve. Uh, or Steve. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Steve does. Um, but, so I was faced with, with going to Oxford, and um, yeah, when you're told you're effectively 50-50 chance of survival, um, 
it's quite scary. I remember really clearly, I, I, got in, I got called just after midnight, you rush in, and then I just had this vision that I'd be in a bed, I'd have somebody like you to look after me, I'd perhaps be given a little bit of Valium and just be wheeled down. No, they go, come on, we're walking to theatre. I'm like, shitting myself, to be blunt, because I don't know whether I'm going to see my kids again. Yeah. Uh, um, and, you know, it was my surgeon again, uh, I described as the hero, as the last few words that was, don't worry, I've got you, I've got you, you're coming out of this. And so that, in a way, you talk about the last words and you talked about the things that, that you know, those last few things, that's when they put, I had that as my last few words, because my family weren't allowed in at that moment, that was it. Um, so, yeah, it's, I describe my journey as, as going into it, physically you have to believe you're going to recover. You have to believe that the doctors and the nurses and the carers are going to get you through, but it's an emotional roller coaster. And I think a great deal more effort could be put into people with long-term chronic conditions and the mental support that they need, but that's a whole different yeah. topic. One that I'd love to talk about. So when you talk about your surgeon and he's saying, I've got you, which I imagine you know, is the kind of confidence that, that you really want to hear, and we've got fantastic people like John that are supporting people through the system. But we think a lot as an agency, more can be done to support the subjective well-being and the mental state of patients, and that creativity plays a big part in that. So can you talk about the kind of emotional support and how that can be addressed? So, so I got none. I, I, mine was a tick box, go and see a psychiatrist or psychologist and see is he mentally stable, he can get through it, that yeah. was it. We've, I've witnessed, I get the privilege now of pretty much talking to almost every intestinal transplant patient around the world. And I get to give my input as to how stable or not stable I think they are going into transplant. And you see those that do not have the support, do not have a community to come back to, do not have, whether it be family or friends, massively struggle post-surgery, massively struggle. Um, I do some work at Stanford uh, uh, in California, and they, they spend time around, what is the music? What's the, what's the music you hear in your room? What's the, what's, the, what's the ambient thing when you come into a hospital? What's the, uh, what's the support group? So, so somebody said to me there, when you sign a consent form, one of the things on the consent form should be, have you spoken to another person that's gone through a similar condition? Have you been able to touch base with somebody else and that power of, of, of connectivity? Uh, um, we're, I think we are brilliant at treating the physical, I think the mental aspect, and I don't mean mental health, yeah. the mental aspect of physical conditions, so. we're a long way behind. And actually, I think, I haven't seen the data, but I suspect you would correlate the data between mental well-being and physical well-being coming together to give you improved outcomes. Yeah. I suspect the science in that would be overwhelming. We, be, we be believe yeah. that 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any further comments? I think um, from a nursing perspective, um, having nursed for, for all these years, you just, you just hope that you are showing kindness and compassion and empathy. I have to say that's what I aspire to every day when I'm um, in life generally, but certainly in, in the clinical setting. But I have been a, a patient. Um, I had um, IVF triplets um, who are now 23 and then a, a buy three, get one free, so Julia appeared three years later. Um, and then, and you know, for 12 hours, I wasn't allowed to see my babies. <laughs> and they didn't, no, they, they didn't think to put me in a wheelchair and take me down to the skaboo. And I'm sat there as a nurse thinking, I know that this is about the worst thing that a mother could have. You know, you've got premature IVF babies that I haven't even seen or held or touched. And I'm sat there thinking, please, I was asking, please could you just take me down there? And they wouldn't do it. And I remember looking at this nurse and I thought, you are really, really cruel. And, and that lives, that will always stay with me. Um, and I think there is nothing more important to support patients going through um, chronic illness, acute surgery, to have kindness and time. It is invaluable and I empathy. I say one thing to that is, I think that kindness and that empathy flows both ways. 
Mm. I'm sick to death of patients, however stressed we are, abusing the nursing time or yep. abusing the doctor's time as well. If, if you want empathy and respect back, you have to give it. Yeah. And I know there are times when you can't, trust me, there are times when I just go, just treat me. I mm. feel really bad, just treat me. Mm. But for the rest of the time, for me, healthcare is just a relationship. It's, just, it's a two-way relationship mutual empathy and mutual respect. I think because um, I worked for 15 years in minor injuries, so minor injuries is like a mini A&E, and um, sometimes you know, s staff get fed up because they think, oh, why are they turning up at you know, 10 to 8 when we shut at 8 because they've got a bad ankle? Why didn't they come earlier? But actually my response is we, we've got a duty to help educate the people that turn up at our door. So I don't think they do it with malintent. I think we've created a, uh, um, an environment where people just feel that they can, they don't understand. And I think that I think something that can be done to help the NHS staff is to help educate the public. We have become so. It's, we take it for granted, so for granted, the NHS that we've lost sight of its value. Um, and I think it's really important to put some really positive messages out there about, about that. Mm. So, and Which also also our admin yeah. staff that sit behind it all. It's not just about the front line. There's masses of support behind it as well. Yeah, yeah of course. About Michael's uh, with his illness. The thing is, it, it does help if somebody's been through what you've been through. And like mm. you just said, it's uh, at the hospital now. If somebody's been through something, it's always nice that somebody goes to talk to them about it because it because it does it help it. it makes a difference and it's like when I move patients I move patients like say the elder the children whatever but I always go back and see them the next day I always go and have a look at them mm -hmm. I mean there's one lady I did move she was very ill and she was an old very old lady and they wanted to uh, pat slide her across and she said I don't want to go pat sliding I just said to her I said tell you what give me a cuddle she gave me a cuddle mm -hmm. I lifted her across, got her across, she said, I haven't had a cuddle for 23 years, she says yes, to me. Christ. I says to her, I'll tell you what, I said, you know what I have to do now, I have to tell my wife I've cuddled you, you know. <laughs> so I went back the next day, I went into Ward, and I went round, she called, like I said, I can't mention the patient's name, but when I went round, I went round and said, hey, you're looking up, have you had your hair done? Yeah, nothing, I put comb through it, she says, yeah. I said, I think you look really, you're feeling a lot better. She said, yeah. I said, just keep an eye on that nurse. I've been watching her, John. I've been watching her. And it's interacting with people in the hospital because it's such a lonely place. And as you just said, yeah. as yourself, yeah. you're so frightened when you're going in hospital, you, you, you are frightened. And like I said, we have, I'm not just saying about uh, our hospital, or our Blackman. At first, my mum, my mum came in uh, like a few years ago before she passed away. She was frightened to walk through the doors. Frightened to walk through. So I sat down and said, why are you frightened? I said, I'm not bothered about my illness. I'm just frightened to go through the doors. Mm -hmm. And they've made it more approachable now. When people just come to the door and they're looking around, somebody goes, hello, can we help you? Mm -hmm. And it's the first response. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, Tal, um, when we first got involved with this book, I think there were 70 patients that had been treating mm -hmm. with your uh, invention. And now you say, I think there's 104. Mm -hmm. John alluded then to the relationship between people who've been through the process before and how it can benefit and support. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? When, I, when I was first taught through the total root replacement in 1993 in incredibly cold clinical terms by Charles Pumphrey, no longer with us, a cardiothoracic surgeon, uh, there is no humanity. There is just a stark mechanical, technical, clinical description of what they're going to do to you, which is pretty terrifying. And through the whole process, I felt unbelievably alone. And I can remember by the time I came out of surgery thinking, I'm gonna change this. So I wrote a personal experience of my, uh, of my trip through surgery. We now have a section on the Extent website with real patient stories on. I invite every patient to write their story. I only correct them with respect to spelling, punctuation and factual, everything else is left the same. And Dozens of people have contacted me and said, I was told I had a dilating aorta. They talked me through route replacement. I was terrified. I found your website. I read the patient experiences and I instantly felt comforted because I know there's a whole community out there 
and they're real and they're human and they understand and I no longer felt alone because Jesus Christ you feel alone when you're I mean I was only looking at a five percent mortality operation nothing as dodgy as Michael but even so you feel unbelievably alone in anything that any of us can do that will make people feel less uncomfortable has got to be good for them and probably has got to have a beneficial outcome in terms of their of their clinical outcome and Matt, you spend a lot of time online in communities. I do indeed, yes. I just wanted to add a bit to the, to the, the whole patient experience thing in. If I may, Dave, just for one second, because I haven't, n- none of you have heard this before, but before I, had my, the night before I had my surgery, my brain surgery, I was in a room on my own, which was facing uh, Great Ormond Street, and I could hear all the kids crying over there in the wards overnight. There were no curtains in my room. Uh, now... Hopefully things will have changed by now, but uh, all I had in my room there, nobody came to see me the whole night, and I was really, really concerned, obviously, because I've been brain surgery in the morning. And the only thing I had to keep me company was a, was a, was a gro- stuffed grommet toy. It was a girl from work had given me t- as a good luck thing. And I spent the whole night throwing this dog up in the air and catching it, because I was so... I wouldn't know what else to do. Um, and... Bearing in mind, I was 36 at the time, so it might seem that this is how worried I was. And I actually took it down to me to the theatre the following day. But unfortunately, even Gromit couldn't help me because I passed out just before the, the main event. So <laughs> thanks, Gromit, but you didn't help me that time. But no, it's, it's a whole thing. It's allowing people to take things that they feel comfortable with. I think Because I, I, I'd never talked to somebody that had my surgery before. I didn't even know what was having it put inside me. I mean, now they show you all the different bits and pieces that are going in, but I'd, I've never seen the leads or the, or the, the, the pacemaker or anything that um, I've, I've actually got in my system. But uh, it worked in the end, so thankfully. Sorry. That's all right. Dave. My can I, can I, Dave, can I yeah, yeah, on, on, a, on a positive note about the NHS? When, when I had to have my pacemaker fitted, unfortunately, we, me and Christine were working at North Manchester General, which is only about three miles from here, and we were placing books within the hospital wards, etc., which was part of what we did. And I took ill. I didn't realise I was, but my wife said I look ill, and I went in um, to the A&E department, which was full of people, just like yourselves, with blood dripping on the floor, and, and there's a policeman at the back uh, taking control of anybody arguing because they think they're, they deserve to get seen before everybody else. I went up to the reception, but I decided, because it was so busy, to go out. Thank goodness I started to feel a bit faint more, and I realised there was something wrong. I'd lost my elder brother, Bobby, four years previous to this, and I thought, well, mm, I wasn't so sure then, but I went back in and explained to the receptionist what was wrong. Within seconds, I was not told to sit down, I was told to come to a door, and the door opened, and I was literally thrown onto a trolley, wired up for sound, ECG. I have never ever, and I've worked within paediatrics before, I have never ever seen nursing as good as what I got. Not just on that day, but for all of that week that I was there. I was reassured that, that I would be fine, the machine is doing, going to do all of it. I was, it, was, it was recuperation like no other. I cannot speak highly enough for what I saw while I was in that hospital. And all that was going through my mind is I lost my brother four years earlier with the same problem that I had. I'd watched on TV Francis Wamba dying on a football pitch and they defibbed him. He was so, so lucky. Could have been another story. And it could have been another story for me because she could have said, just sit down there and wait your turn. She didn't. She realised there was something wrong. Thank God we've got the NHS. Thank you very much. That's all I want to say on that. So, w- can, can I just add? Yeah. It wasn't the NHS that, just, that let me down, it was my stuffed grommet. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, one of the things, Matt, one of the things we've been talking about is yes. um, patients, patient support. Yeah. Um, people have been through previous experiences, communities helping each other out. Mm-hmm. You're obviously incredibly active online, so do you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, well, I think patient communities are absolutely crucial to outcomes. Um, I'm in several different commu- patient communities, and the things that patient to pay, peers to peers will divulge to each other, that they won't divulge to their consultant, is phenomenal. The things I've heard about pe- what people go through with Parkinson's not the, mo- not the, mo- not the uh, fine motor skills that you see are a problem, but the emotional stuff and the things that, honestly, people's lives have been ruined, but they won't, they're too ashamed to tell their 
consultants about it. So now, I think the crucial, Dave, absolutely, because <coughs> people feel so much better being able to share their experience. Mm. Now, to, I mean, I, it was well over 20, I did Parkinson's well over 20 before I even knew anybody else had it, let alone met anybody or spoke to anybody online with it. And, it, and people get a whole lot of peace of mind. And I think the most crucial thing is hope. People get hope and they see what's going on in the community and they get in hope and information that people can get on with these things and there is help out there, I think. And it's, it's, like, it's like, almost like an invisible hand to them, if you like. Okay, so we've spoken so far about innovation and we've talked about support and we've talked about customer experience. want to now change to, um, to, to much more around people's like environment, the people around them and the impacts that has. So we're going to go to Joe Marshall. Hi. Uh, my question is for Michael, but I'd also like to hear the viewpoints of Tal and Naomi. Um, I'm interested to know what barriers you've encountered during your campaign to educate people and change the course of treatment. Have you found that people are generally receptive to your ideas, or have you experienced some pushback? And you want to ask that to Tal as well, right? <laughs> yes, yes, Okay. Exactly. Can I just get my head <laughs> Okay, where to begin, Michael? Um, I think this country, the NHS, has as much world-class uh, innovation and thinkers as any other healthcare system in the world, sometimes, perhaps, if not better. I think we are probably not even, in, uh, in using football terms, the, the, the non-league uh, for how, uh, for the ability to scale innovation at pace. And, and I'll tell you fundamentally why I believe that happens, and that's been my barrier, which is why I spend six out of every ten weeks in the US now, because the NHS has forced me to do that. Um, we operate... Everybody thinks the NHS is one system. It's not. Um, if you look at, uh, at primary care, secondary care and social care effectively as three system, if you're innovating and you've got a product, particularly technology, uh, and, and this is where we probably are all slightly different. In my case, it's technology that can be used by patients in all those environments. It might start after surgery, they go home, primary care setting, some case social care. You can't follow the money. You have no idea who's going to pay for what in that environment. There's no pathway. So a patient wants a technology to be prescribed, that might come out of your GP's budget, but if they're reporting that data back to the hospital, it should be in secondary care. And then if they're in social care, who pays for it? And until that pathway is clear, the NHS can't scale innovation. It's bullshit that they can. They can't. It's absolutely impossible. The US, if I do a direct comparison, which also is a dysfunctional healthcare system, I am not saying it's perfect, but you get regulatory approval, and if insurance pays for it, you're off and running. There's no other barrier. It doesn't matter where you are in the healthcare system. If you get FDA clearance and you get health insurance to pay for it, you can scale. So, yeah, I didn't have 17 years that Tal has had, and he'll tell you, I'm sure, far more details than I have, but it took me two years to go forget it. And, and I'll be honest, I raised a Series A round of funding 18 months ago we got turned down by 43 companies in the UK. 43 companies in the UK, and we got, we got money from Silicon Valley, typical tech Silicon Valley, who said to me, if I see a single sales number in your financials, I'm out of here. You are not going to raise money in the UK. You are not going to generate revenue in the UK in the next five years. So that's a truthful snapshot of, of why I think we are here today. I think it is not through lack of talent, I think it's not through lack of desire. I think there is just fundamental, practical realities that says, who pays for it? And Naomi, from your point, in terms of the kind of challenges and barriers that you've faced? Um, just, just a constant line of barriers, really, with innovation. It's, I think the very fact that something is innovative I now realise that actually I shouldn't be surprised there's barriers because in a way you're, you're, you're doing something new. So, so in that respect, it's, it's never going to be an easy journey. The bit that I find or have found extremely frustrating is that you know, I was never talking about anything high-end tech. You know, it took me five years to try and get a drinking straw to um, 
you know, to, to get to a, a patent. Um, it took me three years from an, from an idea of having an upside down ruler to get a mug. Um, I had to, uh, the red and, the red and um, amber green coasters, you know, we've finally, finally found a, a, you know, a company to make them for us, but because, because we're making them such a small amount, they're so expensive, you know, like two pounds or something, a silicone, you know, for a coaster. Well, people go, well, we're not going to have those. But then they go, it's a good idea. And I think, well, <laughs> OK, but if people started to invest in it, then I now understand, and I didn't come from a commercial background in any shape or form, or business, or under, as you know, no good at numbers. But, and naively, because I was, you know, started nursing in, in 1980, I used to think that when I went to a cupboard to take out this unbelievable range of, like, amazing equipment, dressings, injections, you name it, that there was somehow this magic NHS factory that just made it. I had no idea of what sits behind everything. No idea at all. And I think, you know, I think that's one of the been a real eye-opener to me. And also, when I went to the mug company, so that's um, Dudson's in, in Stoke-on-Trent, which are a massive great pottery company, I was getting a bit frustrated. I was thinking, well, can't you just can't you just do this and can't you just do that? And they said, come and have a look at our um, pottery. <laughs> so it was acres. I've never seen anything like it. I will never look at another piece of crockery in the same <laughs> light ever, ever again. Everyone should go around and look. And the amount of um, automation, but also then really tender loving care to put the handle on and to put the, the decal inside and things. And so I'm actually now, you know, incredibly grateful that, they, that they've done it and it's on the NHS sup supply chain, which is fantastic. But, you know, that was them actually putting a lot of commitment into it. And if I'd asked them to change the mug at that point, their retooling would have cost something like, I don't know, £50,000? Well, that's what we have to understand and try and work out. And that's where, for example, this clever 3D thing, you know, would have been so... Yeah, it's just mind-blowing, quite honestly. But when you talk about the challenges, and you're talking about cost, mm. it's due to a lack of scale. So the fact that the coasters are a couple of pounds, yeah. if they were all through the NHS, yeah. I'm sure then the cost of purchase would be minuscule. Min minuscule, yeah. And, and yeah. I kind of get the challenges with technology and the complexity with different IT infrastructures and all that across. Mm. But your ideas are brilliant, a total no-brainer and quite easy. Right. So can you just go into a bit more detail about you know, who you're talking to and what kind of barriers are they putting in front of mm. you? It, it seems yeah, crazy. I think um, there's a couple of things, but I think one of the one of the key points around hydration, which is where where the, where the focus is, is that um, it's considered to be such basic care that it just should happen. Um, and fundamentally, there's been so much negative press around care and care delivery, um, and what and it's so easy to blame the carers and blame the nurses and say, you know. Um, they're not doing a good job. 99% of the carers out there, nurses, are doing a really, really good job. Some are doing excellent, some are just working their backsides off, quite honestly. Absolutely, okay. Okay, if somebody leaves a glass out of reach for, just because they put it down, that person who's done that needs education. <laughs> you know, it's education for our carers. Why would you leave a glass out of reach, you know? So, our carers haven't had the right Basic carers have had very, very little education around it. Then the people that need education, I think, probably more than anybody, are the top, top cl clinical decision makers, um, finances, in our country. Because with the greatest respect to them, is that actually helping somebody to have a drink can be one of the most complex areas of basic care. So you just think about the expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, yeah? And and particularly around vulnerable elderly care um, with the um, complexities of um, advancing dementia with such a, a number of the people in our care homes in particular. Um, the amount of time and kindness and compassion and excellent communication skills that you need. And it is day in, day out throughout the meal. It's not like just three meals a day. Trying to get somebody to drink anywhere near enough, you could have to maybe go to them probably 15 to 16 times in that day. Now that's, you've only got to think how many people, you know, and it takes a pair of hands. And if you see somebody trying to give somebody a drink, they say, oh, do you want a drink? And they're like, 
well, any one of us is going to go like that if somebody tries to give you a drink quickly, never mind when it's a hot cup of tea. And, and I do, I actually feel quite emotional saying this now because I seriously, seriously, seriously believe that if we can get hydration right, it is just common sense, good, basic nursing care and everybody understanding that, the red, amber, green will be a flag so that everyone goes into a hospital or into their room in a nursing home, they would know that that represents, so if I had an amber one, that would represent that that person needs some support with their drinking. Amber is full, red is full support and green is their independent, <coughs> based on an, a very simple assessment tool. And then it's like, and so what now? Well, then it's actually planning, well, how much care does that person actually need and what does it look like? Mm. Basic, basic, basic care. But the money that could be saved is in the billions. In the billions. So if we invest to save, instead of firefighting hydration, dehydration, acute kidney injury, yeah, urinary tract in injury, uh, infection, falls, I mean, sepsis, it, the list just goes on and on. The other thing is that there's never been, there's not a doctor that sits behind hydration, so there's no medical lead for hydration. The closest that we've got, I believe, is in the acute kidney injury sector. I'm absolutely thrilled to say that in the National Hydration Network that I have um, <coughs> now chair, um, with Simple Measures, a little CIC that I've set up is hosting it, is that we've now got um, a top intensive, um, um, I can't say it, intensive, <laughs> uh, Professor Hugh Montgomery, um, who's at UCL, to join our small little network. And we've also got representation now from Think Kidneys. Now that is just fantastic, so I do believe things will start to happen, but until we get funding into basic, basic care, education, training, and recognition, I don't want to ever hear somebody say, I'm just a carer. They're not just a carer, they are remarkable people. And a large, large number of our carers in this country, English is not their first language. And I worked abroad um, in France, uh, in Switzerland, speaking French as a 25-year-old nurse. Oh my goodness, speaking a foreign language in your day job is exhausting, yeah? It is exhausting. Everything that you're thinking and saying you're having to do in your second language. When you're not fluent, you're, you're okay. And then you've got people talking to you with their own accents. I made so many faux pas, I can't tell you. In fact, I probably shouldn't here. Um, but I just think we need to, we really need to embrace what people are doing in care. So I'll get off my soapbox. I mean, every, I, I agree with everything you're saying completely. Mm. Um, I think it's absolutely perfect. Thank okay. you. And um, Tal, um, barriers. Before, before I start ranting, I've, I've got to say, I've only been in hospital once as an inpatient, I can remember, at the Royal Brompton. And the nurses worked like galley slaves. Mm, yeah. I would say that they, the reason they couldn't put the glass in my reach or chide me into drinking anymore was they were too bloody busy. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they were... I don't know how they survive it. I mean, part of, the, part of the problem surely has to be the nurse-to-patient ratio is too low. And if we, if we gave people an even break and there were not eight nurses on the ward but 12, you know, they could do their <coughs> job to a standard they might be much more comfortable with and, and the patients would benefit. But anyway, uh, innovation and barriers. Um, a lot of the presentations I start with by saying the NHS, I believe, was the greatest gift to civilization of the 20th century. And I really mean that because apart from the fact many other countries have tried to emulate it, an awful lot of people come over here to use it. But that doesn't mean it hasn't lost its way, and it has seriously lost its way, and it is in serious trouble. Uh, it's am it, ama it amazes me that successive governments keep bailing it out. Um, there, are, there is so much wastage inside it that could be reversed. It would be reorganisable, but that's perhaps another, uh, another, another argument. When I started this project, I was focused exclusively on avoiding a root replacement operation. So I got Professor Treasure involved and John Pepper and various other little bit of technical team, a commercial team, raised the money, started the company, blah, 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 blah. The NHS, any, any of the NHS innovations people I, I met were simply trying to jump on the coattails of the project and make it their own and get some acute of it. Nobody I met in the NHS had any sense of urgency and any sense of commitment to wanting to engage and contribute substantively to this project. 
So I've got no time for any of them. Imperial Innovations, the great Imperial College, turned us down. Actually, it's a good thing they did because their terms and conditions are screwy. If you fail, we'll just say you failed. If you succeed, we'll take our slice. Lovely. Um, I think the, because the NHS is so big, as Michael's alluded to, you've got all sorts of cultures, all sorts of different groups of people, and depending on which area you end up in, you will find an entirely different um, process. And when I say area, I mean geographical area and clinical area. I got lucky, I met Tom Treasure. Astounding guy, works like a bloody galley slave, amazing bloke, rigorously, ruthlessly honest, fantastic guy to work with. But look at the numbers. When I, got to, when, I, when I got through the feasibility, that was uh, March 2000 to May 2004, and got the first operation, and I thought, right, they'll all be flocking to come and do it. No chance. Fifth, it took us 11 years to do the first 50 patients. Eight of those years, I had to take no salary and rely on my national Cold War pension because we had the greedy grasping patent agents to pay, the greedy grasping insurers to pay. The second 50 patients took two years. We'll probably do... Ten, we'll probably do 50 patients in this 14th year. But who on earth would be insane enough to spend 11 years trying to establish a new technology? Mm. You know, if you're DuPont or Medtronic or Microsoft and you can throw money at anything for as long as you yeah. like, it's viable. If you're a five-man band, it's a serious struggle. And if anyone were to ask my advice, would you, do you think I should innovate in the NHS? I'd say, go and commit suicide and hang yourself. It'd be much, much quicker and easier yeah. and probably less painful. So I think we've got serious problems in, in believing naively that any such thing as innovation yeah. is possible. It's rubbish. The NHS, in terms of not the clinicians, but in terms of the suits, is full of passengers who just want to sit on your coattails and ride you and make their bloody career and make their promotions out of you. There's no sense of urgency. There's, everywhere I go in the NHS, apart from most of the clinicians, there is no sense of urgency. It's full of passengers. The government doesn't need to spend more money on it. It needs to sack half the suits, scare the other half of the suits into getting a decent day's work out of them and raise the morale of the clinicians because they can see all of a sudden they're not going to carry all these suits. Uh, it's, it's a very, very difficult problem. It's very fraught. But the idea that all these innovation networks and oh, we're linked up with this and this, it's complete garbage. Yeah. The people who invest in these sorts of things are people who want to get on in their careers. So they're not going to take any risk with anything new. They're going to invest in things which are a dead cert. So if you've got anything vaguely innovative, vaguely R&D-ish, like pairs, they're going to run a mile from it. So you're never going to get the money. And anybody who goes in thinking differently is an idiot and really should have done their homework a little bit more carefully before they started. But I think you raised one point that, that's really valid, is that... You know, Only one? Well, no, to, <laughs> to be honest with you, to be honest with you, I was bored after the first five minutes. But the point being, everybody here on this table and probably everybody in the room would laud the NHS for the way, the care it gives, the compassion it gives, and, 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 and the treatment it gives. But in terms of innovation, because whether you like it or not, it's a political hot potato that is governed on a five-year cycle, there is no reason for anybody to make a decision because they have to. It's about keeping their position mm. for four uh, to five years. Actually, what you mean is, Michael, there's every reason for them not to make a decision. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Take that is the problem. But that, that, that is just the problem. And, and in fairness, it's nobody's fault. That's the way the NHS was built. And nobody's got the bottle to change it because yeah. they'd be voted out. Mm. The truth is, I work an awful lot with NHS England, with the digital health team, with, with senior management. They absolutely love Jeremy Hunt, okay? They think he gets it, he understands. Do you think any doctor or nurse has voted for Jeremy Hunt? Absolutely no not. Chance. But do you think he'll actually be able to do anything? No chance, because it's such a political hot potato. But they say, trust me, I sit in meetings, he gets what we need to do. He to and he's been there the longest health secretary of anyone. So that's not a political comment, it's just the practical realities, but the system is not geared for innovation. So uh, I think there's two aspects to that in terms mm. of there's innovation and the scaling. Mm. And when I work with people like you guys and outside mm. of, of the healthcare heroes, I do think there are people who have ideas. I think the challenge is taking those ideas, as Naomi, you're describing, and actually scaling it. Mm. And I think that's, that's probably the biggest challenge. Um, 12 months ago, we released a white paper on the millennial healthcare professionals. And Tal, what we were doing is we were looking at this, this sort of newer breed of clinician mm -hmm. versus the more traditional. 
air condition, those that are more interested in the traditional kind of career path and working up as you describe. And the thing that we identified within millennial healthcare professionals is they were more collaborative than the predecessors. They were more up for perhaps driving innovation. And most importantly, they were more up for being entrepreneurial. So I don't at the moment think they're necessarily the main stay of the actual community, but we do believe that there are people, millennial healthcare professionals, who hopefully, fingers crossed, will be a catalyst for change mm -hmm. and looking more to collaborate. Let me give you a little story. I present okay. all over the world with this, uh, quite a, sometimes to established clinicians, sometimes to medical students, and all the medical students say, fantastic, great result, well done, really, really good. I come back to the pairs, the core pairs technical team, and I refer to a, a certain professor of cardiothoracic surgery who's now the head of R&D at a certain London hospital. He's a lovely guy with a great sense of humour. But when I say to him, you know, those kids in Santiago, wherever it was, they were so taken with pairs. They were really enthusiastic. He said, ah, oh, don't worry. We'll beat that out of them soon <laughs> enough once they get into a hospital. And he's making a joke of it, but it is a real problem. Yeah, you get into the institution... The, the cultural norms you learn or you get thrown out. And once you learn that, you know, saying, why don't we do this? This is a good idea. Once you learn that's not the thing to do, you don't do it if you want to get on. Yeah. And you, there's, there's no way around that. I think, uh, other than right, the total David, cultural At some change. point, they die off. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 at some yeah. point... I didn't say yeah. die. No, but well, can retire just, off just, and millennials come sorry, through. Sorry, just very, yeah. very quickly. Um, the other big barrier is... Um, Everything has to be evidence-based practice nowadays. That's how, that's how we learn, um, and that's what supports best practice. But to get evidence-based practice, you've got to have investment to do research, um, to do evaluations, um, and, and that means brains, that means clever, and I'm not a researcher. <laughs> and so you need that investment as well. And, and so for me, it's been like a chicken and egg situation. So the fact we've had this recent evaluation on a part of my work, which was independent, I'm hoping that that will support the scale. And today I put a, sent out a letter for, um, to do a, a call for action to, um, to reduce admissions from care homes, so um, with UTIs and falls, based on, that, on those figures. Okay. Um, because we have to do something. <laughs> so. I agree. Um, we're running out of time, but I was going to go to Alice. You've got a question for, for John. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, John, my question was around, um, well, my dad's chronically ill. He's in and out of hospital quite, quite a bit. Um, and one of the things that I've observed is the staff are all great, um, but outside of the ICU, you can tell that a lot of them would really value that time to be able to spend with patients. You could tell that they would like to interact with him a bit more, reassure him, make him feel more comfortable, but they simply don't have the time because they've got a ward full of other patients who are waiting for their care. Do you find that is a problem and how do you deal with that in your kind of day to day? Well, myself personally, it's not a problem for me because any time I go onto any ward, I always interact with every patient I go onto the ward. And like you just said, people are busy doing, like say, you're on the IC unit. But the thing is, it doesn't take a thing if somebody's walking past us to say hello to people. You, ne you need to interact with people. And you need to keep to interact with people. And that, like you just said there, is that when I do go onto the wards, I always interact. And like I say, I always go back. I'm with any patient, I always go back. And if I, sit, if I go on the ward and somebody's down, I always go and sit and talk to them. It's like... It's like when we move bereaved, if I do move a bereaved person, normally the curtains are closed. They close the curtains, unless exceptional circumstances, but they close the curtains. But I always say to them, when I go out, open the curtains. And when I've opened the curtains, I always go back and sit and talk to them, because somebody's sat outside that person, and it's an horrendous thing for the ward itself. And I always go back and say, but like as you say about your question there, people should interact with people, because that's, that's the most important thing. A long time ago, they didn't used to interact, they used to walk along, nobody used to talk, but if you find now in hospitals, they do start to interact with people. Well, they do it certainly at our hospital, they have to, because you need to interact with people. And where does that come from in your hospital? Is that just something that's become the culture? Is it from the like, leadership? Is it through training? Because it sounds fantastic. It is. It's like, what it is, we, we launched a bereavement steering group three, three year, half years ago. And we brought that in where, like I said, we moved patients. But that interacting people, it's like I said to you, when my mum was there, you know, four or five years ago, when she was there 
and she couldn't walk through the doors. Now you can, because what it is, if you go to the door, somebody says, well, can we help you? Where do you want to go? And we'll lead them to places or different things. Like we have now, we have a bereavement suite uh, upstairs. So like now where they used to, uh, they used to uh, go and pick the certificate up, they used to stand in a queue. It used to just be, and it worked nice. But now what they do, they'll go to the main reception, they'll lead them up to the bereavement suite, they'll sit at, they'll have a comfort where they sit down and they'll take them in. And what it is, when they take them in, there's a nurse there, and if they want to talk about what's happened to the family members, they can do. So it's like a lot of it's communications, like I said, just communication. In our hospital, they have a communication system, so people do get to know different things at different parts. But like you said, the communication is the most important thing. Well, to me it is anyway, because like I said, you only get a few seconds, it's like here today, you get a few seconds to talk to you, quite honoured to talk to you people, but you only get that few seconds to pass your thing over. And it's so important because you don't get that second chance. Okay, sorry, go on. It's very, very briefly about my experience. I, mean, I don't know whether anybody else had the same opportunity, but for the first five years after my surgery, I emailed on the anniversary of my surgery, the surgical team that operated them on me and said thank you and gave them an update of how I was doing. And the response that got was incredible. Uh, the fact that I'd, I think the fact that I'd bothered to do it in the first place, they were surprised about. But I think to keep that interaction going after, rather than just saying after the surgery, oh, thank you very much, you're brilliant. But keeping, I think it's important to keep that communication channel open, maybe not by, by put their email account, but certainly to say thank you. And I'd update them on how I was going and stuff, and they really, really appreciated it. So it's, from a patient point of view, it's giving something back to those that, surgeons that have helped you as well, I think. I guess that goes back to your point, Michael, you were making earlier in terms of it being a two-way relationship and respect. And yeah. I, 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 yeah, I never forget the time I walked on the ward and my surgeon was in tears because patient gone through my surgery passed away and and the emotion the raw emotion and you think oh it's their job it's not and I'm sure it's the same no. with you every patient is a human being you know I was tear just hearing your story and, and and I think that respect that mutual empathy that relationship it, it absolutely goes both ways the thing is Michael the thing is every patient time if I can't give it any any respect my uh, my mum, that was a mummy's boy, I'll be honest with you, but I move every patient, whether they're alive or passed away, like I would move my own mother. Yeah. And that's what it means to me, in a and nutshell. I, and I could see that with my surgeon, that the, the care he gave, and, and, and the, the feeling mm. that he felt, and you know, and okay, it's close to home, because I know it could be me. Uh, um, you have to give that back. You know, and, and I, I would imagine that, you know, those receiving Matt's updates mm. are just brilliant. Um, can I just say, can you just put in here, my surgeon hates me because I take him running up in the lake this <laughs> and uh, he's got a 24 hour run next year booked in, it's called the Bob Graham Mound, 42 yeah. peaks in and he wants me to help him do that. So yeah, yeah, it's great when you can say thanks, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It, is, uh, absolutely. it definitely sounds that in the majority of cases, you know, the healthcare, they are actually healthcare heroes. There are people doing an amazing job, mm. taking time and bringing a huge amount of positivity to everyone. Of course, there are exceptions, mm. but that's what I'm, I'm taking away from this. Mm. So the key thing about the projects really was healthcare heroes, but it was a passion project. And the thing about every single hero in this book is their determination and their passion. And everyone will have seen today everyone's determination and passion. So, Lindsay, you've got a final question. And we're going to start with Matt. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we all agree that your positive attitudes are really inspiring. Um, so my question was, we do all have bad days. Um, when you have a bad day, what do you do? Uh, do you have any specific techniques that you use to make yourself feel more positive? <laughs> um, Kick the dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Don't tell us that. No, don't. Um, if I, because the, the very nature of my condition is so I don't know what's going on from one minute to the next. So all I can look at it is if, well, I'm, bad, I'm not feeling so good at the moment, but at least I'll feel better later. That's the way I get past it. So I know it's not going to last forever, and so I'll just pop another tablet. Have another tablet, Matthew. You'll be fine. <laughs> Maybe a cup of tea. And a cup of tea. Well, no, I'll spill that usually. <laughs> <laughs> but I get the hydration somewhere. So now I, I just well, I've just I've just done exactly what I do. I try and make humour of it. 
and if I have a bad day, if I have, have a bad day or something happens, I'll try and make humour. People who follow me on Facebook will often see silly stories that have happened to me, like struggling to make a sandwich in, for my lunch, and then it, I'm just about to try and cut it in half, and it slips and falls in the dog's bowl. <laughs> dog's water bowl, I should say. It's not the other bowl. I would have got it out the other one. <laughs> but the dog's water bowl, no. And it's just like falling down the stairs and the dog jumping on me, and, you know. <laughs> When I go up to the bottom, oh, that's how I deal with it, I think, through human and positivity. Okay. And uh, Tom? Uh, if I've got work to do, I lose myself in the work. I become a workaholic now, I just work, eat and sleep, which actually leads to a crappy quality of life, <laughs> um, which is a problem. But other than that, I read the patient experiences on the website because they are unbelievably uplifting. If any of you have a crappy day, just go on to Extent, patient experiences, and read some, and you will be lifted. It's just fantastic. So apart from the fact those experiences help other patients, they help me as well. So maybe I was being entirely selfish when I put that idea together. Who knows? <laughs> Naomi. Um, I agree about the work. It's, it does become, I mean, I think I've written some of, or somebody wrote for me about it. It, is, it has become an obsession. Yeah. And... And it doesn't feel healthy when it has to get to that level. And my frustration, is, and when I feel like it's reached an obsessive point, because I get up first thing in the morning and I'm, I am downstairs, that computer's on, and my head is so full of stuff. Yeah. How can I get around this problem today? Yeah. So, and then you start, you know, and it's like, and, and it is, and, and you literally stop and question your sanity. What on earth am I doing? Um, the time, the money that I've invested. But it sounds cheesy, but deep down in here, I have known from the day that I saw that toy for the children, using my Anna sucking on a, a straw toy, that I knew that I had something there. But I knew that actually to focus on a product would be looking at the tip of the iceberg. And actually, and that's because I'm a because I wasn't just a product designer, I was a nurse, and I went into nurse mode, and I thought, hang on a minute. <laughs> it's all this under the, under the water. The size of this iceberg is enormous, and I have just taken a, a, you know, a can, off, uh, can off a tin of worms. I can't think what it is. And, and then I have a glass of wine in the evening. <laughs> 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 that works. Uh, John? Well, we're talking about a bad day. I mean, I mean myself personally, I do love my job, like I've always come over saying that. It's just, just my job. I'm lucky. I've got a good family. I've got a lovely wife. I've got fantastic children. But the thing is, we're talking about a bad day. I walk into work, I walk into work, I walk into the hospital and I see people that's so ill. I think, it's not a bad day for me. <laughs> not a bad day at all. Because at the end of the day, it's a bad day because they're not so well. And, and to me, we have good days and we, do, we all have good days and bad days. And we've all lost people and we all get down. But at the end of the day, when you're going to work, I leave it at the door and I'd be so professional. But to me, I don't, we all have, I don't have a bad day in that respect because at the end of the day, I'm so fortunate. My dad always used to say, if you open your eyes at morning, it's a good day. And that's what's right. <laughs> Have to follow you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and then we have, and then we have, then we have Steve, it's like who's going to wrap you up. Put me in the middle of this, whatever. <laughs> um, no, I, I listen. I, I think I wake up every day unbelievably excited by what I'm doing and scared shitless at exactly <laughs> the same time, and I walk that tightrope. But I, um, when I'm down, and and yeah. Listen, there are plenty of down times. I think for me, it's, I just have the greatest privilege that I've been able to produce a product that's gonna help someone else. And that is just the best thing you can possibly feel. That, that feeling of being able to help someone else, just, yeah, that's cool. And Steve, when you have a bad day, if you ever have a bad day. When you are given a second lease of life on a table, and the clinician says to you, I want you to do everything what you've done, Steve, before, and I want you to do everything the same after. <laughs> Run as often as you want, as, as, climb whatever you want to climb, just live your life normal. I don't, have any, I don't have any more bad days. Not after being on that table, I don't. I just get up and do what I love doing. 
and share it with as many people and inspire the next generation. I hope. It's a sum tune. <laughs> okay, so uh, with that, 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 we're now out of time, unfortunately. So that's um, the end of this Lynx Academy uh, special on the healthcare. So I just want to say a massive thanks to all the panel um, for their insight today, for your contributions to the healthcare heroes, but mainly to your for your work in healthcare and improving outcomes. So a huge round of applause to all of them. <laughs> Join us next time.